You're listening to the Chronicles of Aguna, the Arsenal podcast. I'm Martin Tyler, and you're listening to Harry Simeon. Hello and welcome back to the Chronicles of Aguna, the Arsenal podcast, part of the 90 Min Football Network, currently sponsored for the month of December by our good friends over at Pro Prep. I'm joined by a very, very special guest. Jeremy Fulham is with me, the uh, main man over at TalkSport, uh, a good friend, a colleague. Jeremy, it's a pleasure to have you on, mate. How you doing? Um, it's a, the pleasure is all mine, Harry. It's, um, it's an honour to be invited. I'm great. Thank you. No, it's great to have you, mate. Great to have you. And the reason we've got Jeremy here is because Jeremy is a huge Leeds United fan. And of course, Arsenal are at the moment, at the time of recording, scheduled to take on Leeds United at the weekend. Although all of that has been thrown into doubt because of the COVID-19 situation. Games being postponed left, right and centre at the moment. I've just heard of another three or four at the weekend that are not going to be taking place. First of all, Jeremy, we will talk a bit about Leeds United, but do you expect this game to go ahead? It's difficult to say, Harry. I mean, Leeds have more players out through injury than most teams have out through COVID at the moment. So, if anything, it would be a blessing in disguise. I'm sure we'll get on to that. But I, it's hard to see any way in which we won't have any sort of um, short or a prolonged break in the Premier League, given that everything that's going on at the moment. I find it baffling, really, that that we're still having full crowds at stadiums. You look around Europe, games are going ahead behind closed doors. Games are going ahead with... 50% capacity and you know something's got to give here really in the in the Premier League and in the UK because things are getting very quickly worse and not really any better so I find it very difficult to think that things will carry on in the way they will be I've just seen Jurgen Klopp's notes in his programme ahead of the Liverpool game tonight and uh, we've got Thomas Frank has come out today saying that he thinks there should be a break in the Premier League and I think um, it won't be too long before we see some sort of postponement. Yeah, completely agree. And I think you hit the nail on the head there where it, it just doesn't make sense to have big crowds in stadiums. I mean, I mentioned it on the post-match reaction show following the West Ham game. I was at Emirates Stadium on Wednesday night. There was a full crowd. There weren't very many COVID checks in progress. You know, they were asking for the COVID pass and you were basically asked to wave your phone at somebody who didn't pay any attention to what was on the screen. So it is a weird situation. It is a strange situation. But I guess for me, and I was talking about this on a previous show, and I'm interested to get your thoughts. I think unless the government actually step up and say this cannot happen because we've got the evidence, we've we've looked into all of this and we feel that the safest thing is to reduce capacities or to prevent fans from attending at all. Then you kind of can't expect the clubs in the Premier League to be at the forefront of all of this and leading the way. No, of course not. I totally agree with you, Harry. And I think the problem here is the Premier League is such a commercial behemoth. Um, it's worth so much money to, well, first of all, to the clubs. I mean, they're already struggling from the impact of the first few lockdowns. It's worth a lot of money to the UK economy as well and to the government that they probably don't want to have it shut down in any sort of capacity, even though it's probably the right thing to do. But, you know, I don't think we're on a politics podcast, but we've seen that this government doesn't necessarily like to, um, like to follow the idea of doing the right thing, uh, judging by their actions this time last year. Yeah, completely agree. And as you, as you say, it's not a political podcast, but it's so hard not to, from time to time, uh, dig into that just a little bit. Um, Jeremy, tell us a little bit about Leeds United season so far, because they impressed a lot of people last time out. Me and you were working together on, on, an, on a few Leeds games, I think we did, uh, over the course of the season. Really impressive, attacking, free-flowing side, always dangerous. There's a little bit of second season syndrome going on at the moment, though, but... I know there are a lot of injuries. I know there are a lot of issues. Tell us a little bit about where Leeds are at the minute and, and what's kind of responsible for that. Yeah, it's look, it's not been an easy season. Um, you know, that's that's easy for anyone to see after the, especially the highs. I actually, there's, I was chatting to someone during the week and if you'd swap the two seasons around, most Leeds fans would have been quite content if this was the season we had last year, having just gone up. And then the season we had last year is the season we we're having this year as kind of a progression build on season. But uh, sadly, it hasn't worked out quite that way. Look, the injuries have been a massive, massive issue. I'm not one to to sit here and, and moan about injuries too much, but this is like an injury crisis I've never seen before. 
Um, you, you looked at that Manchester City game the other day. Bielsa said it was the worst performance he's had in his four years at Leeds. Leeds' worst Premier League defeat in their history. Marcelo Bielsa's worst defeat in his history as a, as a in his career as a manager. That team was decimated by injuries. There was only one senior player on the bench. Uh, the rest of that team was all academy players. So if you think that's bad, they have three more absentees from that Manchester City game. Jamie Shackleton came off with a hamstring injury. Um, I can't remember who else it was who got injured. I know Junior Furpo is injured as well. Um, so we're even more... Oh, sorry, it was Daniel James as well. So we've got Daniel James, Jamie Shackleton and Junior Furpo has been suspended as well. So we're down three from a 7-0 defeat to Manchester City. So we really are down to the bare, bare bones here. But like I said, with the injuries, it's not massively an excuse because if you look at what the injuries are, their hamstrings, their calves, they're, they're all muscle injuries. And I think, honestly, 80% of them are all hamstring injuries. And I don't think there's a coincidence there. I think that might be a knock-on effect of um, of the very intense training that they do. A lot is said about Marcelo Bielsa and his intense training sessions. And I just think that they might be catching up a little bit on the players, especially now as we get into kind of cold winter months. Uh, and it's really, really starting to affect Leeds. Yeah, I was going to ask you about that because that is a criticism that's often levelled at Marcelo Bielsa. And at times I felt like it's a little bit of a cop-out when people want to criticise him. It's very easy, isn't it, to say that, well, he's too intense and therefore players get injured. Um, but a lot of this is is rotten luck as well, isn't it? And you must feel like that as a Leeds fan. Yeah, it is, of course, rotten luck. And I kind of, I'm, I'm always of the opinion that luck in football will correct itself over the course of a season. I remember being on the wrong end of some very sketchy VAR decisions last year, but I remember being on the right end of some as well. I, I, I feel that these things kind of, level themselves out but I just I don't know this, this current injury crisis I said to someone today I've never known anything quite like it we had injuries we had four injury issues last year as well but it was nowhere near the scale of this and part of me funnily enough a lot of Leeds fans were looking at this current run of fixtures we've obviously got Arsenal coming up the weekend we've just played Manchester City and Chelsea away back to back and we've got Liverpool on Boxing Day away from home uh, provided that one goes ahead a lot of Leeds fans looked at this and said, well, that's going to be zero points out of uh, 12 available. I wonder if it's actually kind of good to have so many players out injured while we have these difficult games that no one was expecting us to get any points from anyway. Just get them out of the way, let whoever's injured recover as much as they can, and then we can move on and focus on a new year and, and kind of taking points off teams around us. Are you concerned by the prospect of relegation? Is it something that you're fearful of or do you still feel that Leeds have enough? I am fearful of relegation because the form the form hasn't been good. Now, the players have been trying. My only saving grace from relegation is I take a look at the league this year and it's very, very congested when you go from um, 11th downwards. We were... We should have beaten Brentford in the game before we played Chelsea, and that would have seen Leeds up to 11th, which was crazy considering the kind of narrative around the bad start. We had one defeat in seven. Now, a lot of them were draws. But my biggest saving grace when I look at relegation this year is I do think there are three worst teams in Leeds United. Um, and I think two of them are in the bottom of three already. When you look at Norwich and you look at Newcastle, I think they're both going to go down this season. But then it's kind of a pick em. You've got anyone from Leeds. You've got uh, Southampton, I think, might be dragged into it. Uh, Watford. Burnley and I just think that Leeds once they do get all their players back fit and firing and look that's a big if given the kind of bad luck that we've got this year but I just I hate to use the term too good to go down but I just it baffles me that a team with a fit and firing Calvin Phillips, Rafinha Patrick Bamford if he's on form um, we've got some good defenders at the back as well like Elam Melier I just think those kind of quality players will be enough to keep Leeds up provided of course that they do get fit how do you feel going into the Arsenal game? And again, you know, it might not take place. We're, we're well aware of that at the time of recording. But how do you see this one going if indeed it does take place? Are you are you confident that Leeds can take something? Because they were really good against Arsenal at Ellen Road last season. I know it was different circumstances, but it, it's not an impossible game to take points from. No, well, it's funny. I actually follow Arsenal quite closely. My brother's a season ticket holder there. Um, I was at the Emirates last Saturday to watch them play quite well against the poor Southampton side, it must be said. Uh, but I mentioned uh, the four games that Leeds have, the Chelsea, Man City, Arsenal and Liverpool game. The narrative from Leeds fans is, well, if we're going to get points from anyone, it's going to be Arsenal at home. I felt a lot co more confident having watched them against Everton, who I don't think are a good team themselves. But Arsenal were absolutely terrible in that game. 
thought they were really, really poor. Okay. Uh, but I, as, as I said, I was at the Emirates on Saturday against Southampton. I thought they played some good stuff. I thought it was a great goal by Lacazette. Lovely team move. And I thought they were excellent against a very, very solid West Ham team. I didn't think that they would get too much out of that as well. Um, and I think coming off the back of that West Ham performance, I'm not sure about yourself, Harry, but I think that was probably Arsenal's best performance of the season in the Premier League. Um, you've got a team that's coming into this game in a lot of confidence. They've kind of buried the situation with uh, with Aubameyang with two wins out of two, no goals conceded. And they're facing a team that, let's face it, is decimated with injuries <laughs> coming off the back of the 7-0. So, you know, the, the in terms of confidence and momentum, things couldn't be much more swung in Arsenal's favour. Uh, my only hope really would be that Arsenal do like to kind of dilly-dally a little bit around at the back. They're very fond of playing the ball out of the back. Got a lovely goal from Lacazette against Southampton, building out all the way from the back. Leeds are relentless with their pressing. So if Leeds can put enough pressure on Arsenal when they're trying to pass the ball out from the back, then we might have a chance in catching you and maybe nicking a goal. But conversely, if Arsenal are able to play around that Leeds press, it could be, it could be a field day for, for Arsenal. Interesting stuff. You made me feel a lot better about the game if indeed it <laughs> takes place. But I'm, I always do this, Jeremy. When we get somebody on from a, a, an opposition side in the lead up to a game, I'm always interested to get their feelings on Arsenal looking from the outside in. Because I think as an Arsenal fan, there's a lot of back and forth between each other. You know, some people are really positive about the direction in which we're headed. Others remain quite negative. There's always a clash of opinions, always a clash of ideologies. And it's really hard to kind of remove yourself from that Arsenal bubble. So what do you make of Arsenal under Mikel Arteta? And, and I know you, you've praised them for the last couple of performances, but what's your overall feeling on the direction in which Arsenal are travelling? Um, well, I think first and foremost, I think they had a very positive transfer window. Um, I think the squad they've got at the moment is full of very good, young and hungry players. The jury is still out for me a little bit on Mikel Arteta. Um, and it's funny, like he's very much in a bit of a peak at the moment, but he does go through a lot of troughs. And as soon as the Everton game finished, you know, the knives were sharpening for him. You saw fans calling for his head on social media. I just, I'm not fully sold on him yet. I think he did a good job in winning the FA Cup, but he had a good platform there to build on it and he just hadn't quite taken off. And I think the way he handled the Aubameyang situation, although I agree that he should have been stripped of the captaincy because I just don't think he was really captain material, I think the way he seems to fall out with players is a bit of an issue. And he seems obviously like quite a disciplinarian and a taskmaster, which is good. But I think when it comes to managing elite level players like uh, like Pierre Aubameyang, or at least someone who considers himself an elite level player, uh, I think he needs to be a bit more savvy in how he do, does that. Um, we saw something similar with Mesut Ozil as well. I just think he needs to be a little bit more, a little bit more experienced when he's managing players like that. But in terms of... In terms of his playing style and, and what he's doing with Arsenal, I just think he's a little bit short of the top-level managers. And I just don't know if... Look, I could be wrong. You're currently sitting in the top four. I just don't know if he's the man to lead Arsenal to glory long-term. Yeah, and it's a fair reservation to have. You know, I'm of the opinion that he's done a good job so far overall. But there are, as you say, certain things that you should be questioning. I, I think you're right. I think the man-management thing with sort of senior players is a bit of a, a worry, is a bit of a concern. I wonder if the fact that these players happen to be ones that also aren't performing at the level we all know they can has impacted here as well and has given Mikel Arteta a feeling that he can go that one step further because ultimately it's not a situation with Aubameyang, for example, given the way he's played as to whether I keep this guy happy, we finish in the top four. I don't and we don't. You know, it's it's really... Um, it's it's I think with those players, because they're not at the level required at this moment in time, I think he's had it an easier task of moving them out because the fan base are not sitting there going, well, you can't possibly get rid of Aubameyang. He's not playing well. So it just makes it a much easier thing. Almost like Aubameyang's form has almost made that decision for him. I mean, I've heard a few people mm -hmm. speaking this week. If Aubameyang had 15 goals and 15 games, would Arteta be as quick to, to take the captaincy off him? Well, I'm not quite so sure, but... I do, I do kind of like the idea that he is trying to weed out some of these, I, I guess, kind of older, more influential personalities, and he is putting a lot of faith in some of the young players. And I think some of the signings, like I said, have been been very good. But it'll be interesting to see who gets that that armband long term as well. Yeah, brilliant stuff, Jeremy. Thank you so much, mate. Really, really appreciate the insight. Good to talk to you as always. Let people know how they can follow you and uh, what you're up to. 
Yeah, well, look, I'm a, I'm a producer on Talksport. I do, I do some other bits elsewhere as well. If you want to find me, uh, there's not much to see there, but I'm on Twitter at jfulham underscore. So have a look at that. That's Fulham with two L's, uh, unlike the the football team as well. <laughs> Brilliant stuff. We'll pop Jeremy's Twitter handle in the description. Make sure you check him, check him out. Hit the like button. Subscribe to the channel if you're new. If you're listening via the audio platforms, do leave us a review. And fingers crossed, this one goes ahead. Arsenal, <laughs> Arsenal to lead this weekend. Catch you yeah. later.